okay. So everybody is online? Yes, Marit. Um, are you able to hear us? Yeah, I think so. Can you hear me? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. I, the voice is little uh, low. My voice is low? Yes, Maharaj. Then now it's better. Yeah, if, when you are nearer to the uh, phone or whatever uh, camera you have. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll be nearer to the camera. <laughs> Yeah, so this is better. So, so we have with us um, His Holiness Bhakti Vigna Vinashtra Nasima Swami Maharaj. Uh, we would like to uh, welcome him and uh, thank him for his uh, valuable time. He will be sharing uh, his valuable realization and knowledge with all of us. So, over to you Maharaj, you can start. Okay, thank you. Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupakadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Bandeham Shri Guru Shri Yata Padakamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sakrajatam Sahagana Raghunathan Vitam Tam Sajevam Sarvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakanitamscha He Krishna Karana Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namastate Tapta Kanchana Gorange Radhe Vrinda Vaneshwari Vrishamanu Sate Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Namam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Precharine Nirvisesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasade Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare So we're speaking on the topic of pure devotional service. In this matter, we are going to begin by first of all speaking about what is not pure devotional service. This is a standard procedure when describing pure devotional service. Jiva Goswami begins first of all by describing what is not pure devotional service. We see within our Krishna Consciousness Movement a lot of devotees engaged in what they consider to be devotional service, but there are a lot of uh, deviations also 
from the actual standard of pure devotional service. So we, we want to spend some time today, since we have three days, uh, today we'll spend the time looking at the different deviations which come in the form of devotional service. So, one of the interesting uh, pastimes of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in uh, showing to us the importance of pure devotional service was in his cleaning, his, the cleansing of the Gundicha temple, the Gundicha marginum. Marjana pastime, right? Lord Chaitanya with all the devotees before Ratiatra, they would go to the Gundicha temple and they would clean the temple so carefully. I'm sure you're all quite familiar with the pastime, how Lord Chaitanya, he didn't just clean one time, but he cleaned twice. And then he used his own cloth to clean the temple and to dry the temple. And he would encourage the devotees to collect as, many, as much as he could of the impurities, the dust and the grains and the sand and whatever was there that shouldn't be in the temple. He encouraged them to collect it and throw it out, remove it, throw it far away from the temple. So this pastime of cleaning of the Gundicha temple is in relation to how we have to clean the heart. We want to perform devotional service, we have to overcome all of the, all of the impurities, remove, out, remove all the deviations from pure devotional service, recognize them and get rid of them. We can often see within our Krishna consciousness movement how the congregation, because our movement nowadays is congregation based, you know, I joined the movement in 1971. In those days we were all living in the temple, anybody lived outside they were a little unusual. Usually everyone came and lived in the temple. And living in the temple ensured, you know, a, a very good standard of regulation, waking up early in the morning, bathing, even if there's no hot water, and going for sankirtan also. These kind of things which went on along in the beginning of our movement, we don't see it so much today in our movement. But in place of what used to be there, we see a lot of things which are not very pleasing. For example, we can see the influence of the modern age, the technological age. You know, all the devotees have handphones. One, one uh, lady was inquiring from me some time back about, she said one of the devotees in her temple approached her that she could help him to purchase a handphone. So the lady generously contributed for the devotee to purchase himself a handphone. And, of course, the devotee was saying that it would be very good for him to help his preaching, but we've, she later found out how the devotee was using it to, you know, watch movies and listen to mundane music, things like this. Sometimes in, a, in an ashram where you have a number of brahmacharis or a number of people living, 
Sometimes you can hear these things in the night, you can hear the men, or sometimes they're more discreet, they use their earphones, but they're listening to something mundane, listening to some kind of movie or some cricket match or football match or these kind of things which go on. And these of course have nothing to do with devotional service. These are a big deviation from the path of pure devotion. So in Krishna Consciousness, we have a real challenge to try to encourage the congregation to, to be, be aware of the deviations which can come in devotional service. Of course, we know within our own preaching fields, not everybody is so serious. Not everybody is so committed to Krishna Consciousness because we're congregationally based. We don't know how much the congregation are practicing. Some people may be good and others very weak. Some people, you know, they walk, watch a lot of television, they, wake, they stay, stay up late watching TV, wake up late in the morning, chant rounds when they feel like it, they cook, may not offer, sometimes they cook and they use things like garlic and onions, mushrooms, these kind of things which are not really proper. But because we are a congregation, we can't really do much about it. Unfortunately, you know, you do get a lot of people like this, that, that maybe in the beginning, for a little while, they were really serious and they got their initiation. But after their initiation, they get a bit slack, a bit weaker, not so careful. So, as Leaders of the Krishna Consciousness Movement, you know, the sannyasis, they're meant to show the example and we're meant to, we have to preach and we have to lead the, the devotees. We have this, this is the challenge which we face to try to keep people in Krishna Consciousness and to try to keep up the standards which Srila Prabhupada taught us. I remember Srila Prabhupada in 1977. You remember Prabhupada's health was not good. It was the final year, his final year on, on, and his, of his manifest pastimes. And Srila Prabhupada was uh, spending time sometimes in Vrindavan, sometimes in Mayapur. Mm. So he would, he, he wasn't quite so active as he had been before. Earlier he'd been, you know, really active and a lot of time, moving a lot and preaching all the time. But final year his health was really down and he couldn't do so much. It was more resting and trying to get his health back. So sometimes he would ask, uh, he, he would have uh, Bhakti Charu, His Holiness Bhakti Charu Swami, he'd say, he would tell him, find, get a newspaper and tell me, is there anything interesting in the newspaper? Is there anything which we need to know? You know Prabhupada didn't want to read the paper himself, but at the same time he wanted to know what was going on in the world, he wanted to know if there's anything which he needs to take an interest in. Because Prabhupada is a preacher, he was always thinking how to preach and what things to preach about. Just like when he was in America that time, 
they read the Time magazine, the cover of the Time magazine was crime, what to do, why and what to do. And Prabhupada said, we have the solution, we have the answer to all this. And a meeting was arranged with the head of the police department. He came and met Prabhupada. They had a very successful meeting, very nice meeting. So Prabhupada was always interested in current affairs and bringing into it Krishna consciousness, introducing Krishna consciousness into current affairs. So similarly, people today, you know, they like to know what's in the news, what's going on. But often they're not able to dovetail it into Krishna consciousness. They don't have quite that expertise which Prabhupada had. I remember some years ago His Holiness Jayadweda Swami presented a course. I think it was in Vrindavan or it may have been Mayapur, I can't remember. But anyway, Anyway, the course was about uh, how, to, how to utilize Krishna conscious philosophy in any modern current affairs topic. And anybody could come and give a topic from the newspapers and Jayadweda Swami would give the Krishna conscious perspective on it. So like that, Prabhupada also had the same mood. He liked us to be able to preach about all these different current affairs. So my point is that, you know, people like to hear the news, but they don't often relate it to Krishna consciousness. If we just simply absorbed in the mundane news, then that's just Gramya Kata. It's not devotional service. We want to try to bring up our level of Krishna consciousness to devotional service. We want to bring up our consciousness at any rate to devote that everything is in relation to Krishna, utilizing every aspect of the current affairs, the politics, the social, the history, all, whatever's going on in the world, see it all in relation to Krishna consciousness. And certainly with this pandemic going on here in the world today, it's a big preaching affair, big preaching opportunity for devotees. And we're seeing also ordinary people are interested, they want to hear, because they don't have any answers, they can't understand why it happened and what's going on. So it's a very good time for preaching Krishna consciousness trying to give devotional service. This giving devotional service, of course, is one of the aspects of devotional service. Once we get the seed of devotion, we have to water that, that seed of devotion right? by some mercy we contact the pure devotee and we get the seed of devotion. Maybe I'll just ask for some uh, response here from the devotees listening because I know you're all very senior men, you have a lot of... No you know, are there other ways besides the mercy of the pure devotee by which we can get the seed of devotion? Would someone like to respond to that? Previous life. Hmm? Continuing to the previous life? Previous life. I don't know about that. Previous life, you, you mean you may have been a devotee in your previous life, so you're attracted again to take up devotional service? Well? Yes. Maybe. It may be possible. Maharaj? Yes? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear. Go ahead. According to Shastra, it is not possible. There is a verse that says, Bhaktistu Bhagavad Bhakta Sangyana Parijayate Satsanga Prapate Pumbi Sukriti Purvasanchite Even the piety to come to devotion 
It's the required devotee association in bulk. Without devotion, Mahaprabhu even says, Krishna Bhakti Janma Mula, the root of Krishna Bhakti is Bhakta. Without Bhakta, there is no, absolutely no uh, connection with Bhakta. Well, to nourish the bhakti, we definitely need the association of the devotee. But Prabhupada does say that, he, he writes for example, it's in, uh, in that book about knowledge, renunciation. What is it? There's that book. Uh, that, yes, Bhairagya Vidya. Yes, that book. Yes. So in that book he writes that one can get the seed of devotion from the Bhagavad Gita. Simply from Bhagavad Gita, one can get the seed of devotion. And he also writes, he also, Prabhupada also stated that we can, we can, although it may be rare, but we can get that seed of devotion simply by the mercy of the Lord. But getting that seed, once we get that seed, to actually cultivate that seed, there has to be the devotee. The, the devotee's presence, the pure devotee, to nourish us, to help us, to nourish and bring that seed, allow that seed to grow and to flourish. We have to have the association of devotees. But Maharaj, I have a question on that. Okay. Even for, even for Bhagavad Gita, without devotee, there would not be Bhagavad Gita published or given to uh, public. <laughs> well, yes, you can say that, yeah. You can say that you need the devotee to print the Bhagavad Gita. And even Krishna's mercy. Yes, Krishna can do it directly, but generally we never see that until, unless some devotee opened the temple or some devotee had a, some arrangement where Krishna gave the mercy. The Buddha is always involved. Yeah, this, indirectly they're involved, but the, 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 the seed of devotion is coming from the Bhagavad Gita, it's coming from the words of the Bhagavad Gita. It's not, you know, the devotee, you could say, is instrument, but the actual cause of the seed of devotion is the Bhagavad Gita, or the okay. book, right? No. Yes. So a little, a little distinction there. <laughs> okay, so anyway, we get the seed of devotion, and then, we you know, that's certainly good fortune. Brahmanda Paramite, Kunya Bhogya Vanjeev, Guru Krishna Prasadi Pai Bhakti Lata Bish. We got the Bhakti Lata Bish, but there's also the Karma Lata Bish, there's the Jnana Lata Bish. Ah, these kind of things, the, the Anyabilasita Bhakti, la, Anyabilasita Lata Beach, <laughs> these kind of seeds are all there. Not so desirable, not desirable at all. The one we want is the Bhakti Lata, and we have to be able to distinguish between what is the, the weed and what is the actual plant. And it, sometimes it's not an easy job. Some things are very difficult, sometimes it's very subtle. And we see, of course, within our Krishna consciousness movement, some of the challenges which come in our own Krishna consciousness movement, particularly things like uh, Ritvikism, which is there. And, you know, these Ritvik people, they're very convinced that you know, they're right, you know, that th this is what Prabhupada wanted, we're doing what Prabhupada wanted. They're, they have very strong conviction and because they're getting some success, because they're getting money, money's coming in, they're getting some financial resources and they can do a lot of work, a lot of things, they're getting achievements, recognition from the government and so on. So they're thinking, you see, we're right, we're successful, so it must be right. But philosophically, it's all wrong. It's not really the way it's meant to be at all, because they've gone against the instructions of the Founder Acharya. 
they're saying that you can go directly to Prabhupada, although Prabhupada is no longer physically present. So this is one kind of deviation which is there, which is something we're, we're always confronted with, especially in India, preaching in India. The Rikvik movement is quite prominent here. They have their Akshaya Patra program. And it's a, it's a problem. And then you've got other things like you've got devotees who were in ISKCON and they were initiated by Prabhupada maybe or by some senior Vaishnava in ISKCON and then they go off to Gaudiamat. And they say it's the same. It's not different from ISKCON. We're all, we're all preaching the message of Lord Chaitanya and we're serving Prabhupada. And they, these kind of people, they like to come around ISKCON and try to influence the members in ISKCON and try to convince them that, you know, you don't have to just stay in ISKCON, you can come to our temple also, you can come to us in here better than you here in ISKCON. You know, so these are different threats which come by way of devotional service, challenges. And these challenges, we have to expect these kind of things to come up from time to time. Even when Prabhupada was present on the planet, there were challenges, there were threats. We had the Gopi Bhava movement in Prabhupada's time. The devotees were meeting privately to read sections about the gopis and their intimate pastimes with Krishna. And when Prabhupada heard about it, he was really, really upset and he severely chastised the devotees who were involved. So these are all, you know, threats to the mode of pure devotion which Prabhupada tried to establish with the Krishna Consciousness Movement. And as Prabhupada Nugas, we have the duty to understand fully what Prabhupada wanted and work to try to keep up the level of devotion which is actually needed for us to come to that platform of pure devotion. We have to try to avoid all these uh, well, we have to be able to remove all these obstacles when they come, when they confront us. Or if we cannot, we cannot remove them, at least we have to be able to properly deal with them so that they don't disturb our own devotees and our own mood of devotion. So this requires, we have to know very clearly Srila Prabhupada's instructions and his teachings on this matter. Any comments? I have a question, Maharaj. Yes? It, according to uh, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, it looks like that the two way the mercy is manifesting, as you were emphasizing, one is through the devotee, one is through the Bhagavan, Krishna. And uh, that is also divided into three categories. If I recall, uh, Alokdan, Harda, that uh, in infusing the heart by glands, Mahaprabhu did that when he was going to South India. But then uh, in Krishna's story, we see that Krishna did not deliver the Pandavas, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Kauravas or all these 640 million in the beginning. He could have just, his, he was presence. So it is uh, the mercy, am I supposed to uh, understand that it is actually up to his willingness to deliver or not deliver? Of course, Krishna is the supreme independent Lord. It's, uh, he has his own will. What, what is his plan? We cannot impose our d thinking on Krishna. Ultimately, everything is his plan. But at the same time, we have his Krishna's teachings also. 
Just as we have Prabhupada's teachings, we have also Krishna's teaching. What does Lord Krishna want? Lord Krishna wants us to, to preach the message of devotion. So we have to recognize the instructions of our authorities, what they actually want, what is actually necessary. Lord Krishna, he is the independent Lord. If he wants to deliver and everyone and anyone, he can. But he understands everyone's particular mood, particular nature. He, know that, he knows that not everyone is going to surrender to him. We know there are four kinds of people who surrender, four kinds of people who don't. They're not going to surrender. So why should Krishna worry about them? In the 16th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes about those who have demonic nature. Let, let them go to hell. They, stay, take, they take birth in lower species of life repeatedly, again and again. Why does Krishna allow that? Because that's what they want. They're happy, they're satisfied to take birth in these different demoniac species of life repeatedly. They don't want to become devoted. They don't want to be a surrendered soul. They don't want to be a devotee. But we see also Putana. Putana somehow she wanted to be a devotee. She came disguised as a devotee. Even though she's coming to kill Krishna, Krishna took her back. So this is the mercy of Krishna. So who can understand Krishna's plan, Krishna's mercy. It's inconceivable what he wants. We are just instruments. We're trying to do our service to Guru and Krishna, working in cooperation with the devotees, trying to introduce Krishna consciousness and in enhance our own Krishna consciousness. We want, Prabhupada said this Krishna consciousness movement is for pure devotees, right? Prabhupada considered all the devotees in the Krishna consciousness movement to be pure devotees. The devotee had asked Prabhupada, aside from you, are, are there any other pure devotees in the planet? And Prabhupada simply asked, how many people do we have in this Krishna consciousness movement? And then he said, then there are at least that many pure devotees. So the Krishna consciousness movement is a movement for pure devotees. We want to understand what, what does it mean to be a pure devotee? And in order to come to this mood of pure devotion, we have to understand what is not pure devotion. So the obstacles which we face are there, these uh, attachments, these attachments to fruitive activities and philosophical speculation, these are the threats, the challenges to our pure devotion. I don't know if I answered your question very well, but... <laughs> uh, that's correct. That's clear. Okay, thank you, Prabhu. Okay, so we were speaking about the, uh, the problems to the pure devotion. Uh, the, the, the threats there, this karma beach and the jnana beach. The desire for material enjoyment, and desire for liberation. So we want to cultivate that actual, the actual seed of devotion. And we want to cultivate this, uh, without this desire for fruit of activities, without thought of liberation, simply thinking about loving Krishna, developing that mood to love Krishna. Therefore, of course, Knowledge is very important. Without knowledge, then how can we develop love for Krishna? We have to know about Krishna. We have to have some, to cultivate this relationship with Krishna. It's so important nowadays 
trying to get people to read the books. A lot of uh, propaganda going on, Our new the new Minister of Education, Prabhu is doing a wonderful job propagating the need to read Prabhupada's books and getting different devotees, very senior devotees, to speak about their realizations on the importance of reading Prabhupada's books. And some people may feel, oh, it's not really important, or I read them all, I've gone through them, you know. <laughs> we think that, that we think because we went through them one time, that's enough. No, we have to go through them repeatedly, we have to know them. Prabhupada wanted us to make, study the books threadbare and go right through it and know it really. Is it, he, he told the temple president of New York Temple, he said, uh, you should cram my purports, cram, you know, just like if you're at college, you have an exam the next day, you may stay up all night cramming, just trying to get everything learned really well. So Prabhupada wanted us to study his purports in a similar mood like that, to really cram them, to get this knowledge, to make it clear, and this will help us to cultivate this mood of devotion. Jiva Goswami said, if one has an attachment for hearing Krishna Kata, he is considered most fortunate. Getting people to hear Krishna Kata. If you have a taste for that, for reading books and for hearing people speak the philosophy, then this is very, very good. It's, we're very fortunate. But it's not very common. People, general, their taste is more for, well, they like, to, they, they like kirtan, they like prasadam, <laughs> to get devotees to really want to hear, that's a challenge. But this is something which we have to do. As devotees, we have this task to inspire people to read and to get them to want to hear more. So, we ourselves have to be the examples for that. We have to bring people up to that level that they really want to hear, they really want to chant. So, I was looking through Shiva Ram Swami's book about pure devotion, Shuddha Nam Chintamani, and He's describing about the different seeds of the Kripa of devotion. And the seed we want to cultivate, of course, is this pure bhakti. But we have to understand how to get this pure devotion for Krishna. Sometimes in preaching about Krishna, people were thinking, well, I heard all this before, I know all this. But we have to understand that there's always a need to hear it again and again, just like Srila Prabhupada spoke so much to us that we're not the body, because he wanted to really get that message through. And he had to speak it so much constantly to bring it to our attention, to remind us, to take us out of this ignorance. So, so much more even today, people are in ignorance, even our own devotees, they're very attached, they're very materialistic, they have a lot of desires, material desires, and we want to encourage them at the same time somehow to become Krishna conscious. So somehow or other they've been fortunate that they've come to our Krishna Consciousness Movement. We have to think how to give them the greatest benefit, how to encourage them to go on in their Krishna Consciousness. So what is actually the qualification? We see that there are different uh, levels of devotees. The Madhyama devotee is generally considered the preacher. Kanista devotee, materialistic devotee, doesn't 
usually preach much. He's just more in the temple with the deity. And somebody on the highest platform, the Uttama Adhikari, he thinks everyone's already engaged in Krishna consciousness. See, uh, he also doesn't bother to preach. And so in order to distribute Krishna consciousness, one has to come to the intermediate stage, the Madhyama level. One on the Madhyama level, he will make distinctions. He will offer his worship to the Supreme Lord. He will be friendly with the devotees. He will give mercy to the innocent and he will avoid the atheists or the blasphemers. He will just neglect them. He doesn't have interest in them because if he will try, if he will try to approach them, generally they'll just become more offensive. They're not going to hear, they don't want to hear, they, and they don't appreciate the fact that you're coming and disturbing them. So the Madhyama Adhikari, his job is to give Krishna consciousness and he will consider who is the right person, who are the people who are best suited to receive this message. Just like we see Lord Chaitanya, that after he took sannyas, he decided to go to South India. And Srila Prabhupada explains that one of the reasons why he went to South India was because it was a better field for him to distribute Krishna consciousness. That the people in Bengal, were all, they were all busy in the worship of demigods and so many other things and it was not a very, very uh, suitable field for preaching. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had challenges there, the students himself had become antagonistic towards him, so much so they were even threatening to beat him. So therefore he took sannyas and left there. But he went to South India for preaching. And similarly, Srila Prabhupada went to America for his preaching, to begin his Krishna consciousness movement. He'd been trying to preach in India with no real success. But then he considered that he should go to the West and he got much better response. And wherever he saw that people were responding nicely to the Krishna consciousness movement, then Prabhupada would put more attention there. Just like Australia was another place which responded very well to Srila Prabhupada's preaching. And Srila Prabhupada sent some of his senior devotees there to Australia to establish the preaching more and Srila Prabhupada also visited there several times as well because he saw the field to be very, very good there for preaching. And at least in Srila Prabhupada's time, it was a very, very good field for preaching. But Prabhupada also told us, don't think that everywhere you go, you make devotees. It's not going to be like that. Some places you may go, you'll find it very difficult to get devotees. People will join, very rarely you'll get people joining. So we do have countries like that, it's very, some places it's very difficult to recruit devotees. But still we continue to maintain our centers there and we keep preaching there. And we also try to distribute the books. We have a duty. But where there's a bigger response, where you get more response, then we put more energy there naturally, because people are responding, people are appreciating, they're taking an interest. So the Madhyama Adhikari, the preacher, he has to distinguish where to put his energy to get results. Prabhupada, he, uh, Tamal Krishna Goswami told me how Prabhupada used to ask him. He would want, Prabhupada would say, how many books have you distributed? How many new devotees have you made? How many properties have you acquired? So this was Prabhupada's uh, concern in our preaching Krishna consciousness. He wanted to see that there's some results coming. Not that we're just there, we're chanting Hare Krishna and nothing is happening. 
nobody's coming, no, no, there's, no, there's nobody coming to the temple, no books being distributed. Oh, we're just happy here, Prabhupada, we go out and chant and we have our, we have our nice prasadam, and, but nobody comes to the temple, we haven't made any devotees. Then what's the point? Of course, some people would stay there, some people have to stay there, but if Prabhupada saw not much interest, the people not taking much interest there, then Prabhupada himself was not so much interested. But he would encourage the devotees to stay there and gradually create the field for preaching. Just like I work in China. So, Prabhupada gave instructions to Tamal Krishna Maharaj about how to organize the preaching in China. Now Prabhupada knew Chinese people are materialistic and it's an atheistic country, it's a communist country. Communism means atheistic, it means no, they don't like religion. And uh, Prabhupada knew it would be difficult to do anything there. But Prabhupada encouraged Tamal Krishna Maharaj, he said, you send the books there and in this way you create the field for preaching. If we distribute the books, people will get some knowledge, they will start to understand, they will start to think a little bit about it. And in this way they will become a bit more aware of what is Krishna consciousness or who is Krishna. Because they didn't know anything, never heard of Krishna, never heard even of yoga practically in Prabhupada's time. But Prabhupada wanted us, you get the books there somehow, you get the books, just like with Russia also the same thing. The books made the feel for the preaching, the, the, arranged for the books to go in there somehow, even though, although these communist countries are very strict about what is printed and what is distributed. They don't want us distributing our literature. But somehow you have to find a way. And in, in the times of the USSR, before the opening up of the Soviet Union, the devotees somehow managed to smuggle a lot of books into Russia and they did manage to print books also secretly, illegally, and it created a very big field for preaching. Of course, there's still obstacles. It doesn't mean that everybody's a devotee in Russia. There's a lot of obstacles there, very difficult. These ch challenges are always going to be there. But Prabhupada understood that this is a sign that Krishna consciousness is bona fide because the demons will oppose it. These people who are demoniac, they will certainly be worried when they see the Krishna consciousness movement coming. It's a threat to their hedonistic life, to their life of sense gratification. They know we are threatening their sense gratification. And they don't want us to come in there. So how determined we have to be to come in and preach Krishna consciousness. So uh, we have to have that, for, that faith that Krishna consciousness is there within everyone. But at the same time, some people are ready to receive it and others are not. We want to give mercy to these people who are ready to receive it. So the Majjama devotee, he can do that. He can make that distinction. He sees the people and he will give them transcendental knowledge, help them to come to Krishna consciousness. So in Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes four kinds of people who never, uh, who do surrender to Krishna, right? Somebody can quote the verse for me. Chaturvida. 
Someone knows this verse, four kinds of people who come to Krishna consciousness. Yes, right. So, are any of them pure devotees? No. No, right. What are they? What kind of devotees are they? They are in distress. Sakama Bhakta. Okay, Sakama. They are also Gyani. Yes. But uh, it, it, next verse Krishna also said later on that Gyani, if it is uh, more inquisitive with the uh, devotional mood, it will be more uh, more higher than other three. Which? So there is a distinction even among those four. Which one's higher? Uh, Gyani, one who is uh, uh, inquisitive uh, mentality with the, uh, if they adapt the devotion, will be more higher, advancing. The one who comes in search of knowledge, like right? Sonaka, like Sonaka, they approach to Sutta Goswami. They mm. come from that background. Well, inquisi inquisitiveness, Lord Krishna says that the one, he describes that the one who comes in for, in, on the basis of knowledge, he's considered the best. But the one who's simply curious, inquisitive, he, he, he's not the best, but certainly he's better than the one in distress and the, the one in search of wealth. But is not better than the one who came with knowledge, like the four Kumaras who come to Krishna consciousness, you know. They come for knowledge. But the one who comes who is curious, he's, he's, he's still on the level, is still uh, karma misra bhakta. It's not, Lord Krishna himself does say, right? Of the, the one who comes in knowledge, he's considered the best, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, Lord Krishna also says it takes time. After many births and deaths, one who is actually in knowledge surrenders to me. But that one who comes in knowledge, he's better situated. Why is he better than the other three? To surrender, it has to be a conscious choice. It is not automatically. Well, the bhakti. Sarvani karmani sannasa dhatma chetasa. Prabhupada said the bhakti is performed with full conscious of Krishna. Yeah. Just a minute. Uh, Prabhupada said Yeah, surrender. They're, they're surrendering for different reasons, right? They're, none of them are really so conscious of Krishna. They're surrendering for different reasons. But the one who who's came in search of knowledge, you see, if, if, if people just come in distress or in search of wealth or curious, then after some time they may go away. Unless they come to the platform of knowledge, they'll just go away. They'll give up Krishna consciousness because they've just got some, you know, just some material interest. They have some material purpose. And after some time they just go away. We had one boy, he was coming, and he was so curious, he had so many nice questions, and then he just stopped coming. So I asked, I met him again after some time, I asked him, what happened? Why you don't come anymore? He said, oh, I have no more questions. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, just being curious, it's, it, it's, it's a good start, but you have to go on to, from there. You have to take the knowledge, you have to accept that knowledge. 
without coming to that platform of knowledge, then you're not going to get the real mood of devotion. So that's why we have so much emphasis on trying to educate devotees, having courses, pre teaching, everyone. And even the sannyasis, you've got the sannyasis also studying and teaching, you know, you want the sannyasis also to be well prepared, to go out in their fields, teaching, preaching. I have a question. Uh-huh. Since you are hitting the subject on Gundicha Marjan beginning and then different level, level of devotees, in one part of Chaitanya Charitamrita Prabhupada said that Sahajiyas are bad and then he says it is worse when our people takes on that. It is Can you elaborate on this a little bit? He says Sahajiyas are bad but it is worse when our devotee will take that. When our devotees will what? Will take that means that some devotee will be acting as a sahaja within the movement. Oh, sahaja is within our movement. Yes, that's very bad. Yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit like so we can see the symptom within me so I can purify? Sahaja means somebody take, who takes something very cheaply. And so they may take very cheaply that, that mood of being uh, above a bhakta or being a prema bhakta, that mood of ecstasy, they may take very cheaply and they may imitate, and they may roll on the ground, <laughs> they may b behave like that, they may display some kind of ecstatic symptoms which are not really genuine. So that would be sahajism. Therefore, we have standards about these things in Krishna consciousness. That someone wants to display some ecstatic symptoms, they shouldn't do it in public, they should do it in private. They don't want to display any kind, make any show of these things. Jiva Goswami mentions in the Sandarbha about one should be very cautious, never public re publicly revealing his spiritual position and uh, keeping his own, keeping his realizations to himself, not just simply expressing everything in public to the ordinary people. We know Lord Chaitanya, he only discussed the confidential topics of Krishna consciousness with very intimate devotees. But for the general mass of people, it was Sankirtan, simply the chanting of the holy name. But when it came to hearing Krishna Kata, he would be with his very intimate devotees. Ramananda Rai, Swarup Dhamadar, Sikhi Mahiti, Sikhi Mahiti's sister. Lord Chaitanya, of course, also would regularly go to hear from Gadarha Pandit. Gadarha Pandit would read Srimad Bhagavatam to him. So, not only these people, but Lord Chaitanya is very cautious about what things should be heard publicly. At the same time, he wanted the message of Krishna preached and he sent Lord Nityananda everywhere to go door to door with Haridas and tell everybody, read the books about Krishna, chant the name of Krishna and worship Krishna. So is there a contradiction there? Is it contradictory that on one, on one hand Lord Chaitanya is very uh, careful, cautious about what he's discussing and who he's discussing with, but at the same time he's telling Lord Nichananda and Haridas, go and preach everywhere, tell everyone about Krishna. And similarly, the Korma Brahman got told, 
yari de ki tari kao Krishna Padesh. So, Lord Chaitanya wanted the message of Krishna distributed, but not that we have to distribute all the confidential pastimes of Krishna. That would be wrong. So one has to know what, what to preach and what should be distributed. So Sahajism is where people don't understand these things. They take everything very cheaply and they want to bring the highest thing down to the lowest level. One of Prabhupada's godbrothers, when Prabhupada left the world in 1977, you know we had this Smriti Sabha at Krishna Balaram temple and uh, one of Prabhupada's godbrothers came and this particular godbrother did not have a very good respect for Srila Prabhupada. And so when he spoke, he said that Swami Bhaktivedanta, he brought the highest thing to the lowest level. In other words, he was, you know, he was openly, openly criticizing the devotees, that, you know, that you, you Krishna conscious people, you're all low class, you're uneducated, uncultured, you're the lowest level. But Bhaktivedanta Swami brought the highest thing to you. He, he, he had said like this and he, he said, he said my, my disciples were telling me that I should go to the West. But I told them, I wouldn't like to preach to all these people, to these kind of people. And look at the kind of people Bhaktivedanta Swami has brought here. And in this way he was belittling the members of ISKCON, that, you know, you're not cultured, you're all low-class people. So he was like that. But at the same time it was interesting because it seemed like Mother Lakshmi was inspiring his words that he was actually glorifying Prabhupada at the same time. That because he said he brought the highest thing to the lowest level, that was the greatness of Srila Prabhupada, that he could bring such a wonderful thing as Krishna consciousness and he could present it to people who had no knowledge, no information, no culture, and he could impress upon them the importance and the real glory of Krishna consciousness so that they would accept it and they would help him to spread that Krishna consciousness all over the world. So, that was how we took it. We took it more as a glorification rather than a criticism. Some devotees, they took it as a, a direct criticism of Srila Prabhupada, but other devotees, they thought, well, in some ways it's a glorification of Prabhupada. So Sahajas, they take, they, they take things cheaply, we know, the, they think, the Muddha Gopis, Rasa Lila, Krishna's pastimes, they think that it is all just for common people and you don't need, you, everyone can imitate and everyone can uh, laugh about these things and they don't understand the real purpose behind these pastimes at all. So that is Sahajism. And within ISKCON, is, uh, this Sahajism, I don't know, can you tell me how, how you see Sahajism in ISKCON? What is your own particular experience of it? Have you seen a lot of Sahajism in ISKCON? Uh. I would not say a lot, but I am in the West uh, almost over 35 years, and sometimes I, I don't want to judge Maharaj, but what I hear that uh, they do nice kirtan, they are not interested of chanting japa or, or uh, hearing from advanced devotees, 
they're just interested of doing kirtan and after the kirtan they go, they say now we'll have a more higher taste and they go into some kind of smoking um, i don't want to particularly say any name but most of the leader even in uh, west uh, they are familiar or they at least heard it so i don't know it could be well, there are good and bad elements everywhere. We have to recognize these bad elements and we have to restrict and control them. There has to be some standards. In some places they're more strict and uh, I don't know about what goes on in the West because I'm preaching in the East the last uh, 30 years. So, uh, I'm, although I'm from the West, I don't know what goes on in the West nowadays, but I do hear a lot of things and I see some pictures and I... I know there are definitely some problems, uh, things are not quite the way they, which we would really like them to be, you know. We had one young boy from Hong Kong, he went to the West and he got introduced, introduced to drugs. And that's with the temple devotees, from, from, from the, just going to the temple he was introduced to drugs somehow. So that's a serious problem. Things yes, like. Maharaj, you hit the point, yes. Mm, so th these, are, these are very serious problems, so it's a management problem. People, you know, the management have to be on top of these things and they have to be very careful and try to restrict these people, exactly who, what kind of people who, who come there and perform and do kirtan. We should be a little sensitive, we should be a little careful. That it's not just that they're good musicians, but they have to actually show the proper devotional qualifications before we let them come and do the kirtan or even speak sometimes. You know, they should show the proper qualification. They have, should have the right standards in sadhana. That's also important in chanting yes. the holy name. So, yeah, you may call that sahajism if you like. No, this, open deviations from the real standards of Krishna consciousness. Okay, so I wanted to go on. Now, but I do have a little PowerPoint here. Uh, Prabhu, can you share, can I share the screen? Yes. What do I do? Click on share screen, is it? Uh, yes. Now, it said that you've disabled, I want, you have to open it for me, I want to, I want to p show the PowerPoint. Uh, just for a second. It said I'm disabled, I'm not able to. Uh, can you please check now? No, it's still saying host disabled attention. Screen sharing. Host disabled, yeah. Just give me one minute, I'm just enabling it. Uh, Hare Krishna, Jagannath Prabhu, you have to make Maharaj the host, then you can share the... That's story. right, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So if Maharaj becomes the host... Yes, uh, yes. Maharaj, just give me one minute because I am the co-host. I'm just, you know, making you the co-host again. Okay. okay. Just give me one minute.
meanwhile, you can continue, Maharaj. As I get the right, uh, I will just make you the call. Okay. All right. Uh, Thank you, Maharaj. I wanted to go on in the with the, the uh, PowerPoint production. I want to introduce the three types of bhakti which were described there by Jiva Goswami, which uh, bring out the different mode of mixed devotion, the points of mixed devotion. You see, we have uh, we have. Uh, Devotion which is like a, like a cloud, and we have devotion which is also mixed or reflective. They have, they have reflective and a cloud of devotion. So, Krishna consciousness. Okay, Maharaj, you can share the screen now. Okay. Okay, let me see. Okay, yeah. Mm. Okay, can you see it okay? Yes, Maharaj. Okay, so the objectives here. We, we, we want to be, have a, some awareness of the, the subtleties of bhakti and we want to also develop this attitude of regular self-assessment and inner reflection. Prabhupada speaks about this in the Bhagavad Gita also in relation to the different items of knowledge. The Prabhupada mentions there that one can understand one's progress, how much one is advanced by how he can develop these different qualities. So regular self-assessment, understanding, we have, we have to know what, what is actually good and what is not. So Jiva Goswami has mentioned some of these different uh, levels of devotion, three particular kinds of devotion. He's distinguished, which something a little interesting, a little new for me. I hadn't come across these terms before, but uh, mentioned by Jiva Goswami and his son Darbas. First one's called Aropa Siddha Bhakti, right? Aropa. Now the Siddha here doesn't mean perfection, but it simply means accomplishes. Right? And aropa meaning attributes. And so he accomplishes the attribute of devotion. Pious activity is offered to the Lord. The result is salvation. This is known as aropa siddhi bhakti. This kind of devotion. Uh, Offering, you, you do some kind of uh, activities, we're offering some uh, mun mundane acts. Even the acts are, appear to be mundane, but we're doing them with some devotion. Just like somebody may be doing some ritual some worship of a deity, but they, they do it in a very ritualistic manner. Ordinary people who are not trained in Krishna consciousness, they will simply see the deity as a statue. They don't think of the deity as the Supreme Lord. So when they come to the temple and they come before the deity, they're simply thinking the deity is a statue and they're coming to offer some kind of 
ritualistic ceremony there. They think they don't actually feel the presence of the Lord, but they're coming to offer something. And so they're offering something with a mundane mood. So this is a type of bhakti. It's called Aropa Siddhi Bhakti. The, the, what they're doing is not actually really the genuine devotion. Because where there's genuine devotion, there has to be also uh, faith and knowledge. So these people, they don't actually have that kind of faith or knowledge. They're just coming, they're just doing it, some kind of uh, out of practice, a habit. Somehow they've got this attraction to do something like that. Well, we see a lot of Hindu people like that, Indian people, they will come and do this. They don't know, they don't think of the deity as actually the personality of 